This is Dave Bortner, Freedom Boat Service. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary in business, and we happened to run across these cassette tapes that were produced as part of the Antique Motorboating Symposium, uh, March 31st through April 2nd of 1995 at the Mariner's Museum. We thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to digitize these presentations by icons and luminaries of our hobby. We hope you enjoy listening to them and uh, join us in celebrating our 10 years in business. Thanks. The first file is an extensive discussion of the Chris Craft outboard motor, which was referred to, of course, as the world's finest outboard motor at the time in the early 50s. This presentation is done by Lee Holland. which, as most of you know, were excellent outboard motors. He has a very large personal co collection of these motors. <coughs> Excuse me. He has done an enormous amount of research on this subject. He has before you, and you'll be able to see, a, a truly wonderful collection of, of original material, uh, most of which is on loan to him with some fairly restrictive understandings about copying. Uh, I'm told that this gentleman, when handed any part from either of these engines, can tell you where it goes. I think that's truly remarkable. Please join me in welcoming Lee Holland. And a good morning. I think it's still morning. Have the lights down, please. All right, Chris Craft used an awful lot of their girls that were in the locality, and uh, fortunately, a lot of them were beautiful girls. And uh, as you can see, this usherette, she is saying, "Hey, we got something new here." So first, I'd like to thank each and every one of you personally for attending. And I know I don't know all of you, but I sure would like to later, later on be in, have the fact of uh, introducing myself. And if you feel free to want to ask questions, I have business cards on a table. And if you want to call me at your expense, hey, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, I can answer any question on restoration, on how to put together your engine, how to take it apart, and this is pertaining not only to Chris Crass, but also Avenue and Johnson. Mercury's? Well, that's another story. <laughs> okay, with that in mind, let's, uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself. And uh, I was first fascinated with motors of all size at early ages. My buddy and I, we built go-karts. And if a lot of you remember the old Whizzer motorbikes, and boats, and I built them out of roofing boards, and believe it or not, with tar, just to keep the water out of them. And I powered them with an inboard engine, and a lot of the people never heard of this one, called a Gearholt, and it was made right in Rain City, Michigan. And that little up and downer, and believe me, it would bark. But uh, this tar baby, we named it to call the Vibrate, V-I-B-E-R, with an eight after it. And it did vibrate. <laughs> and we motored that little baby up and down to Fisher Creek, which ran between Rain City and Algonac. I guess I was around 11 or 12 years old then. And my desire for engines soon changed to outboards. You notice here where Algonac is in the yellow, and where the little red dot is, that's where the Chris Craft plant was. And uh, the little street right above a in Algonac called Jankal. That's where I live. So I'm not too far away from the original plan in Algonac. And uh, my desire soon changed outboards as we lived on that river about half to three quarter mile wide and a current of three to five miles an hour. That was, of course, the, the beautiful St. Clair River. And that connects Lake St. Clair to Lake Huron. Also, 
Algonac had also other nicknames besides the world's largest builder of motorboats. One of them was the motor speed capital of the world. I'm going to give you just a second to read that over because down on the bottom is also interesting too. This historical plaque is right on the site of uh, the Algonac River. Just to the right there, you can just barely see it, the ice flows coming down the river. Algonac also had another nickname called Pickerel Capital of the World. Where they ever got that from, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I like to catch them walleyes that are out there. And that's what I call them, walleyes. A lot of people call them pickerel. And I like my fishing buddies had to have an outboard motor to fish with. And naturally, my choice was the world's finest outboard. And that I used on an old, sawed-off, double-ended rowboat. And uh, if you remember the old double-ended boats that you used to have to row, they were a lot of fun. The clinkers. And I thought, well, gee whiz, this is too hard to row these boats against this heavy current. So I just sawed the end off and put a Chris Grab motor on it. It's pretty early, pretty easy to get a Chris Crab back then. I knew many employees that uh, could get discounts living that close to the Algonac plant. Here's a nice little copy of a 10 foot, just skimming right along with a five and a half on the back. This was probably one of the earliest promotions that they had for the kit boat and the five and a half. Uh, in combination with each other. On the side of the boat there, you'll notice that it says Kit Boat. The original name, and a lot of you I'm going to fool here, was not Kit Boat. It was actually called Boat Kit. And I do have brochures that are on the uh, table here. It says Boat Kit Division. I soon learned that any motor can and will fascinate a boy to the point of what makes it run. I, like my dad and my grandfathers, had to find out why. This is a picture of my great-grandfather, who's on the far right there. And he had a big shipyard in Rain City. And he built the old, they call these lumber hookers. They used to run up and down the St. Clair River and transport lumber. This is when I started tearing down just for the mere fact of learning. I'm sure many of you can remember the fact of wondering and trying to find out by asking questions and doing the same. Over a period of my schooling years, it was apparent that I was hooked on outboard motors. I have owned as many as 300 at one time, but none as nicely engineered as a Chris Crap. And something now that's uh, amazing, I have now over 85 of them as Chris Crafts alone in stock. And some of these I, I make different parts for, such as water pumps, cowls, decals, paints, and other items. I do have a complete stock for both the five and a half in attempts. I guess I got more than engines than just about anybody in the world. Well, that's about enough talk about me. So let's get to the nuts and bolts of this outboard. This slide was taken at 2000 Beverly Avenue in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This was, uh, of course, the home where they manufactured the Chris Craft Motors. It all began in the 1940s by J.W. Smith and his chief engineer, Elmer Jasper. Now, Elmer was also mayor of Algonac for a long period of time. Theirs was a decision to build an engine of superior design and quality and workmanship in every detail. The main plant and manufacturing of operations was in Grand Rapids. Harry Cole was a manager of the large building of 63,000 square feet.
This is a blueprint in May of 1950 showing additions that they had proposed with three other buildings. Number two was 37,000 square feet, number three was 86,000 square feet, and number four had 37,000 plus square feet, all on a large parcel of land owned by Chris Craft in Grand Rapids. They also had a railroad spur that ran I have a copy of that uh, blueprint also on the table. Not too clear here. They come out pretty decent, though. Pretty hard to take uh, slides of uh, coming through the sunlight of the window. <laughs> the railroad spur for shipping and receiving of aluminum castings, dyes, molds, etc., from such company as Dole or Jarvis. Dollar Jarvis, by the way, was the biggest supplier of uh, parts and pre-manufactured uh, items. They also made a lot of the molds, dyes, jigs, and castings for Chris Craft. Alcoa Aluminum also was the two biggest ones. Thirty-four other companies also took part in uh, individual things like making of water pumps uh, and other components. Many of the components came in pre-manufactured while others had to be machined. This is an article from the American Machinist dated July 24th, 1950. and states that outboard costs don't have to go outboard, overboard. Very well worth reading, but Again, that's on the table, and uh, I didn't want to dwell into it too much. There are three pages here. One, two. Chris Graff also had a very unique type of water pump, and you say, ah, oh, that can't work, but it did. And it, actually, it worked better than any type of impeller-type water pump. And right in the middle on the left, you see that. It had an eccentric an outlet, a water chamber, and an inlet. And as that oscillated around, it actually pushed the water around the outside of the casting and up the outlet and into the engine. A little bit hard to describe, but actually, here's where the water would come in, would come around and oscillate and come back out this way. There was a hole right here, and it could push right back into the engine. I know I was going to get some chuckles on this one. <laughs> okay. January 6, 1949. First of 23,000 plus five and a half horsepower outboards were showing off their beautiful blue metallic paint. They were trimmed in gold and a hint of white. Five and a half is up here for you guys to look at. Believe me, it is original. It's a 100-point engine. It will start first fall. I guarantee it. Prices for the five and a half was $185, and that was slightly higher than the Evinrude's. Evinrude had one that uh, called a five and a half, or actually 5.4 horsepower model, and called a Zephyr. I don't know if any of you guys remember the Zephyr or not, but that engine was a very hard engine to run, but it sold for $149.50. Johnson's see a five horse model, that sold for $170. Scott Atwater, was a good competitor at the time, and it sold for $179.50. Don't want to bore you with too many details, but I think it's important that uh, the bore was two inches, the stroke was an inch and a half, given a 9.42 cubic inch displacement with a weight of 46 pounds. The propeller turned at 14 revolutions per 25 of the crankshaft or drive shaft almost a two-to-one RPM advantage. 
And again, we got a nice little cutie. November 29th, 1949, announcements went out to market a 10 horsepower version. In June of 1950, sales were offered to the public with approximately 9,000 manufactured until the end of 1953. Specifications of this powerhouse was a bore of two and a half inches and a stroke of two and one thirty second inches. Cubic inch displacement was 19.94, just under the 20 cubic inch requirement for the, oh, they call it the B model uh, classification for racing of outboards. The propeller, oh, I'm sorry, the weight of that engine was a little bit heavier, 72 pounds. The weight of the five and a half was 46 pounds. I think I may have mentioned that one. Propeller had a ratio of 13 revolutions per 17 turns of the crankshaft. And the props for both the five and a half and the 10 were both the same pitch, except that the 10 horse prop was one inch larger in diameter. The price was $315, again higher than the competition of Johnson, Avenue, or Mercury, the so-called big three of outboard manufacturers back then. One very exclusive feature was the many needle and ball bearings throughout all the friction points. This is something that back then was almost unheard of. The rods to the crankshaft had a double row of what they call real fine needles. They had, each rod had 56 needles, and they had to be assembled while they were in the engine. Very, very tricky to put in. And ask me, I know, it takes at least to put a rod inside that block a good two hours. The wrist pin also had a double row of 32 needles each. The center main bearing had 28 needles and was designed not to allow pressure or vacuum from the other cylinder into each other. That sounds like a little complicated, but it did form a perfect seal. And this is very important as one cylinder does have pressure and the other cylinder has vacuum at the same time. I'd like somebody to try and identify this gentleman here. I think I know who it is. Somebody told me who it was. And I'm not real sure, but I think he's sitting in the audience. anybody can tell me, just pop it out. I heard it was Chris Smith, but I'm not real sure. Is it Chris? Don't believe it is. Okay. I was told. Not that one. Okay. Uh, I was told by a good friend and uh, the guy that he claims he painted all the this will coincide with Terry's speech there also, of Terry telling about uh, how they mix varnish and gold paint together to make the gold. Well, this guy, Ken Hutchison, he's the one that told me that this was Chris Smith. That could be. Maybe that's who he told me it was. But this is Algonac here. <laughs> Your brother Chuck, huh? <laughs> okay, we'll buy that. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> okay. The design and engineering of the airflow inside the crankcase was so precise to eliminate the air pockets that would cause any turbulence. And believe me, it was tight. And I do mean tight inside that crankcase. In fact, it was so tight, I would think that... Uh, the crankshaft really acted like a supercharger, and as it would come around, it would actually push the next charge of air and gas into the pistons. Something that uh, everybody says a 10 horse, well, okay, it's really not a 10 horse, and it really wasn't, because as soon as Oliver got a hold of it, they called it a 15. 
And then they updated it to a 16. I talked to Wynn Morrill on the subject. Uh, he was one of the designers. And uh, I had quite extensive talk with Wynn. He claimed that that, action, that engine would actually turn up 22, 23 horsepower. That's not too bad out of a 10-horse engine. <laughs> Believe me, there was not a 10-horse Mercury that could uh, stand up to it. <clears throat> the piston of a two-cycle engine is completely different of that of a four-cycle engine. And if you look at the table, you'll see I have a 5.5 and a 10-horse original new piston up there and if you look at it and you say holy cow I've never seen nothing like that well if you've ever seen a two cycle engine apart you'd say yeah now I understand why that they actually look like they do uh, one side is a deflector and it actually deflects the next charge of gasoline coming in to the cylinder the other side is like a, also a deflector which under our explosion would push out to the exhaust port and push out the remaining charge of gasoline and cause a vacuum to suck in. <laughs> and it's hard to explain what really happens inside of an engine. All I know is the darn thing works and it does go. Yes, sir. sir. Is that the coroller of loop charging? No, sir. Loop charging is a complete different where the loop charging went inside the piston and actually out the piston. Your uh, loop charged piston was uh, altogether different. It had holes in the sides of the piston. You're welcome, sir. The chamber of the cylinder bore has intake ports on one side and exhaust ports on the other. And getting back to this gentleman's uh, question here, the loop charging has a lot bigger porting where the piston would go down and receive uh, the charge of gasoline uh, and actually be thrust upwards. The loop charge engine is a highly more highly efficient engine used quite exclusively today. Chris Craft tested their engines twice. Here we go. Chris Crafts tested their engines twice, once without the cowls, tanks, and etc., and then the completed engines were tested again. If you notice the shipping tags on them and the round knobs. Now, the round knobs were only in 1949. 1950, uh, this engine here in 51, 2, and 3 they used the same type knob for pulling as a 10 horse. Engine changes were very many. And if you notice the numbers starting at 1,000 for both the 5.5 and, and the 10. When they first started out, the engine numbers started 1048J1041. Well, that 1048 meant it was made uh, October, yeah, October 48. So that's really one of the first engines that were made in 1948. That's when they actually started. Quite a few engine changes there. This is for the K model. The K model was, of course, a 10 horse. Up on top, X8, X20, X25, X3, X5, X6, X22 were all experimental engines marked X. And they never got into the public, of course. Strictly experimental. About mid down there where it says die cast tank frames on engine number 101275, uh, any engine before that 
had a different type of die cast tank frame. And that was a very hard uh, thing to polish out because it was just chuck full of, oh, they call it uh, holes in the aluminum, poor porosity, that's what they call it, porosity in aluminum. By the way, both these engines that do have aluminum on them, that's not chrome, that's polished aluminum. Here's a slide of Jerry Rhino. And Jerry Rhino, he ran a, a race of 110 miles with his five and a half horse Chris Craft in competition with other motors up to 10 horsepower. And he came in second. Now the guy on the left, that's uh, C.S. Plews. Now Plews is the manufacturer of the Plews built boat. Uh, Jerry's looking a little bit proud there with his trophy. Now, here's a good question for you. How many guys can identify any of them cars behind them? Now, I had Joe Cabot identify one of them. Joe, you want to tell me which one that was? That was exactly standard. Everything was standard on it, except except that little funny thing hanging on the side there. And it really is a cobbled up job of a, what they call a steering bracket. I love that. I don't know how it ever held up for 110 miles, but I guess it did. This is a very unique picture. I love this one. Called a nine foot challenger boat and motor. And she is popping right along on the top of the water, real nice. Aha! Yeah, great. Did you? Wow! With a five and a half. And water ski besides. <laughs> that's interesting. Good. I was hoping somebody would identify that because that's one of my favorite photos. <laughs> he combs it the same way. <laughs> okay. If you look at the button sticking up in between the gas cap and the pull rope, tell me if I'm wrong on this, Chris, but I think that was for a mechanical tachometer. Okay. Mechanical tack, and I can tell you experience with my dad one time out testing the boats. He didn't, it was real in a hurry changing things, and he didn't clamp the tachometer head to the side of the boat. And something froze up, and pretty soon that tachometer went flying around, and he was really ducking. <laughs> Good story. <laughs> or beat it out of the way more than anything. <laughs> okay, Michigan was second with a 10.2% ratio of upboard motors per population. By the way, this inner office memo was to Harry Cole from Harson Smith. And it is original on the table. And it does have, uh, yeah, there's something there that's even signed by Harry. That was probably a big factor of Chris's thinking and in getting into the outboards. New York, as you can see, is first. Michigan second, Minnesota third, and so on. Way down the bottom was Nebraska. Hope nobody here from Nebraska. Chris Craft carried ads in their major boating and sports-minded magazines. 
And if you look, this is just for 1952-53. They did carry quite an extensive ads. A lot of them were ran monthly. Some of them were semi-monthly, like Field and Stream. I do have a copy of Field and Stream here on the table. Here's a dandy, and I love this one. I think Chris can tell me who this is in the middle there. Okay, that's Silva. That's Silva. And underneath that, let's see. I'm not shaking too bad. Speeds up to 15 miles an hour plus, right there where the little red dot is. <laughs> Silva was also noted for, if you look right up in the front, that little piece there, she would come up behind somebody and more or less knock their bottom spark plug off. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but uh, <laughs> I guess uh, there was a little bit of competition. Sure, sir. That's a standard rate of the lower unit. Just a regular prop. That's a regular engine on uh, Silva's engines. They never had to let her have a, uh, the big engine. Allen had the big engine, and that's the one that's on display out there. Silva had the big engine a little later on. I'm sorry, maybe I should correct myself. I believe there were two made of the Algonac version. And the two, there's one out in display up in front here. The other one was owned by John Schuer of uh, Ohio. Uh, the one out in front is owned by Wynn Morrow. And I've been talking for years to get that one, and I don't think I will, but I'd sure love to have it. <laughs> I've even been looking for uh, just the Grand Rapids version of the racing lower unit. Here's another four-color ad that Chris Graff had. Uh, I believe this one was in, let's see, then draw my memory here. I believe that one was in the outdoor life. Chris Graff also had a lot of brochures. This is probably one of the first and it could be folded into quarters and mailed out to prospective buyers. Here's the outside and the inside. And come on, focus. There we go. Everybody's happy. Everybody's running around with a brand new Chris Graff in their hand and having a lot of fun, huh? This is just one page of an eight-page brown and black duotone brochure that's on the table. And by the way, when you guys handle this stuff, keep in mind it's original. And uh, don't bend it too much. Open it, look at it. I want you to look at it. I want you to, you know, but I want it to go back where there's nothing torn on it. Let's go back and see. Yes, you can. Three screws held the cowling on. And in case of emergency that the rope bound or broke or whatever, you could, uh, I guess, uh, take your belt off with a sharp knife and make it into a rope and uh, wind around there and away you go again. Here's something here, and I found this. See that gas shut off? 
Believe it or not, I found as many as seven different gas shutoffs used on Chris Craft engines, and they're all original. They use so many different gas shutoffs. Of course, they bought them from different companies. I found as many as three different types of detail. Some were gold, some were silver, some were white. Some of the engines in this area here were white, painted white in the later years around here, and gold's where the white is. There's a lot of variances. And all depends who was mixing the paint that day. That's what color engine you got. <laughs> and believe me, there's a lot of different colors. The paint that I have on these two engines, I consider very, very close to what is original. The reason I state that I have parts that have never seen sunlight, been wrapped up for 40 some years, and uh, I tried to formulate that paint and it took me about seven different tries to get it that way. Chris Craft also marketed other sales promotions such as t-shirts, sweatshirts, caps, scarves, and all with the Ten Commander printed on them. If you look at the price down on the bottom, men's t-shirts, ten fifty, and that's price per dozen. <laughs> Even the sweatshirts were fifteen dollars, and that was price per dozen. That's not too bad. Okay, they made test stands. Literature you're seeing, believe me, nobody's ever seen before, even Tom Crew. Tom is uh, probably looking back and saying, oh, yeah, sure, I'd like to have all that thing, but you ain't getting it, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> they even had their own business cards. Who Roy P. McPoland is, is the Marine Department of... Uh, Providence, Rhode Island, who knows? Here's something that was really unique that Chris Craft had. Steering wheels for their boats. Now, I don't know if they were made by Chris Craft or not. Maybe Chris back there can tell me. Ah, great. Piston rings, I got a box of them up on the table, my perfect circle. And uh, if you want to look inside the box, believe me, they're inside there too. Even the directions on how to install them. Here's a unique little thing too that the Chris Craft, an aftermarket thing made by Hobart Marine Company, put out called a dual troll. And I like that great big springs behind that engine. Why they're there, I don't know, but I imagine it worked pretty nice. I would think that might be a throttle right there. Coming on back. It says controlled, synchronized gas and spark remotely or directly at the motor. Completely safe. I like that. Here's something that uh, a lot of people would like to get a hold of a sign for 4250 nowadays, wouldn't you? Or 795? Order today. And that you ordered right from the factory, by the way, Chris Kraft. I don't know, they probably had them made and, uh, by a different company. By the way, while I'm talking about it, uh, Chris Craft also sold an awful lot of their engines in conjunction with Johnson and Evinrude. 
uh, in the same company. They did have, on every one of their five and a half, they did offer uh, something that no other engine did, and that was a safety chain. And that safety chain you could fasten to your motor, to your boat, just in case you forgot to tighten them doggone transom clamp screws and took off down the creek and made a sharp turn to the right or left and says, oh my goodness, there goes my motor. But you, at least you had it hooked on yet. This is another sign that they had for hanging out on a, like a shingle that, uh, hey, we got these beautiful motors for sale. The upper corner of the Chris Craft original hot rod gear case, drawing number EE238, scale is one to one, and it's dated 1031 of 52. I have a copy of that. This is a, the original brochure, but I do have a copy uh, of the blueprint on the table over here. Very well worth looking at. Down on the near bottom of that, they only manufactured, from what I can understand, 25 of these. Now, there's a lot of controversy on that. A lot of controversy saying that there was only 10 really put into production. Uh, but in order to get into the APVA, they had to make 25. Uh, although 10, they say 10 only got assembled. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of talk, a lot of speculation. All I know is a lot of rumors, a lot of flying on that. Now that's a Grand Rapids version of the racing foot to compete in the B-class hydros. Here's where the water come in at, is right here, went up this chamber, and you could either run an impeller here or without an impeller, water come up here and then up to the engine. I've got probably three or four of these drive shafts, and I'm, three of them are different than the fourth one. Why, I don't know, but one is about four inches shorter than the other. I would imagine uh, somebody made this housing here four inches shorter and uh, the original. These gears down here were a one-on-one. -on -one. This gear, your driven gear, and your drive gear were a one-on-one. -on -one. 28 teeth to an inch. Needle bearings, of course, there, there. There's needles there. Needles up in here. No, that's a ball. I'm sorry. A lot of bearings. Let's see, I'm sorry. This is a beautiful picture of the racing foot, the Grand Rapids version. This is probably one of the saddest letters that uh, Chris Craft had to put out, although it's something that had to have been done. And it's a letter stating that Chris Craft is going out of business in April 24th, 1953. More or less the same letter. And this is the final letter that was sent out effective January 1st of 54. Complete parts and service will be set up and transferred to the Holland, Michigan plant. This ad appeared in papers, notice in 
a notice of tooling costing $500,000 plus for a sale of only $50,000. And that was to contact Harry Cole at the Chris Graff Corporation. Oliver bought the remaining stock, and in 1955, the five and a half Chris Graff became a six horsepower. The 10th commander was then called a 15 horsepower commander, and later went. Why did Chris Graff decide to get out of the outboard business? Well, actually sales were diminishing. The kit boats were taking over. Kit boats were the big thing. Uh, later on, kit boats did the same thing as the Chris Graff outboards. They went out of business too. But uh, the primary interest of Chris Graff was to build motor boats. They did build outboard motors, and they did it right. If you look at these, they are done right. Every casting, every piece of machinery on that engine is done right. It's been researched, developed, and re researched and it did run to the way that they should. They ran as slow as 300 RPMs, something that no engine, even today, won't run that slow. Sir? Mm-hmm. Thank you, sir. Oh, boy. Uh, there again, the higher you could turn a two-cycle engine, the more horsepower you could gain out of it. And I would say between seven to 9,000 RPMs would be uh, if you turn 9,000, you were at a borderline there, a real fine border. There were some factors. Some guys used to take out one set of needles out of the rods just to gain a little more speed, and they didn't care how many engines they blew up. Uh, Billy Welcher was one of them. He told me that little secret. Sir? Dents out of the fuel tanks. Well, we can call it Bondo. We can call it what we want, but that's about the easiest way. Being a painted engine, uh, that's a heavy die cast engine on the five and a half. The 10 horse is a little bit lighter weight aluminum, and it will dent easily, and there's not much protection on the side of that. But uh, if you're careful, Bondo does work. Sir. The safety chain brings this back. Uh, Alan and Silva were racing, and Bernard tuned their engines, so they were just the cat's meow. And he came and was chatting with my dad one day, and he said, guess what Alan did? Alan didn't use the safety chain. <laughs> the motor caught on fire, which was very unusual, I'm sure, and Alan had to dump the motor. <laughs> and dump, I mean, it went in the St. Clair River, never to be recovered. <laughs> Tell me where it's at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you to see how questions are going to learn. I have one more question. Uh, uh, with those lower, the racing lower units with the forced water cooling system, mm -hmm. Those were really sleek, and was there a tendency for the ball bearings in there or the needle bearings to disintegrate when they were really running those engines hard? I think the gears were probably the, uh, the stress point of that engine. So the gears would Yeah, the go gears before, were not so the much the bearings. bearings. They tell me I'm running way over, so if the guy's got any more questions, uh, shoot him at me at lunchtime, I guess. I've got any answer to any question. I know, like I said, every nut and bolt goes on both the five and a half and the ten, and I know how long they are. Thanks for listening. Copyright 1995 by the Antique Boat Museum and the Antique and Classic Boat Society. Audio copyright 2019 Freedom Boat Service, LLC.